And that's, the real, that's where it gets really creepy and dangerous. So there's a personality issue here that we must never forget in terms of psychology. I'm important. I'm not the person everybody looks past because I've got secret knowledge and powers. I had a teenage boy brought to me or 25 years ago from my desperate parents, a kid of about 15, and he was casting spells on the kids at a well-known <laughs> Catholic school. The trouble is it was that year nine level where they believed all that kind of thing, so it was causing quite a bit of uh, hysteria in the school. Of course, he wasn't really, but he, he had a personality disorder. Just like some people think they're possessed and they're, they're really going down the track of uh, forms of schizophrenia. But there are others who are possessed. I had a question. Um, you were saying uh, that in Australia, the New Age movement, it came about in the 1960s, and that it was partly a response to mm. people being a bit disillusioned with, mm. I, I think you listed fascism and mm. communism mm. and things mm. like that. But in a, in a country like Australia, those things wouldn't have been too big. Um, mm. what, could people have been turning away from maybe Christianity to some degree? Or yeah, yeah it, it was actually, it was more complex than I suggested. Uh, and it, I, would, I would say the effects in this country came later, uh, late 70s. What was happening in the US and Europe in the 60s that I saw as a university student then, uh, I noticed came later to Australia, as did some radical politics. When um, Europe and the various, like Columbia campus and that exploded in 68, the student rights, that really blew up in Melbourne in uh, 71 with Albert Langer and the Maoists up at Monash. Um, and I worked, was a, and later as a young priest, I worked with the student groups, the democratic clubs that were fighting uh, the Maoists up there. It was a pretty tough fight. But I think that people got a bit sick of politics and universities were very politicised in the 60s and 70s. By the end of the 70s, and this university culture that I saw, so I'm speaking from a pretty narrow perspective, but an influential one socially. Uh, it's there that you see, I think, a shift to spiritualities, new age, and uh, is there more to life than what the ideology tells me, or more to life than making money, or more to life than sport or something? People look for other things. Because we are innately religious. People who are not um, believers in God are repressing something. There is a natural tendency in the human person to the transcendent, whatever you want to call that, towards God, towards the other, the ultimate other. And there's always this search for meaning, the human person's search for meaning in life. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? The three basic questions that we have been asking ever since we started to really think, as animals cannot think, by thinking about thinking, reflecting, one of the things that makes us human. And that can open up all sorts of pathways, good, bad or indifferent. But, that, uh, more, uh, but I th also think the mood of society was this arrogance and confidence in science and technology and modernist architecture prevailing, which is very boring. Uh, and I think people react, start to react against all that, hence the psychedelic use of colour and, and curves and forms. I think of a lot of these things aesthetically because art and architecture is a great hobby and interest of mine. And we also saw it in the church when they dumbed down the liturgy after Vatican II and made it very dull and colourless to the point of being very boring. And now this is an enriching, more cultural texture. And that developed gradually in the 80s as a parallel thing. So you're looking at a social trend that affects religion too. And then we see that the 21st century is now being talked about by some of the expert pundits who write these books about the future, futurologists, etc., as the century of religion. It's no longer not respectable to talk about religion. When I was a boy, it was sort of a banned topic. You, you'd go to church and everything like that, but you didn't, one of the things you didn't discuss in polite society was religion. Oh, no. There's, there's a sec, there was a secularisation then, too. We talk about secularisation now, but I wonder at times whether there was a dualism then. We were very religious in a one sort of form, another way 
part of our lives we're very secular and great confidence. We got a man on the moon. Big deal. Uh, you mentioned earlier about calling spirits, people talking to the mm. dead spirits. Um, is that possible? And if so, I would have assumed that if a spirit goes to heaven, hell, or purgatory, it sort of mm. can't come back. That, uh, that is a very exact and precise question. The church, uh, based again on the Old Testament, consistent policy in the Old Testament, says don't try and contact the dead. We call that necromancy, from the Greek word for death and the dead. Um, a cemetery is called a necropolis, the city of the dead. Necromancy has been forbidden. The reasons are very interesting and I developed these in this booklet. Um, the Christian tradition, based on the late Jewish tradition, particularly the Pharisee form of Judaism, which in spite of his criticisms, Jesus did support, does believe in the reality of spirit, soul, supernatural, paranormal and all that. But it's cautious about interfering with it. The souls of the righteous are in the hands of God, book of wisdom that's and don't leave them alone because once you start to call them back to this dimension of time and space are they going to come back or is something going to come back impersonating them and i believe that most of the seances are diabolical they're little, little and i don't mean that number one himself comes along you know from hell but there's a great complexity of entities in the spirit dimension, which various theologians have tried to describe and speculate about. It's speculative, a lot of this, let's be honest. And uh, they're liars, come and tell. And one of the marks of the devil, again, this runs from the Old Testament through to the New, Christ says it, Paul says it, he tells lies. Lying is one of the ultimate sins because it inverts the gift of truth which is why one of the most wicked men of the last century was Joseph Goebbels in Nazi Germany, the great propaganda liar. So we, uh, we therefore don't want liars coming from the abyss or the pit, whatever you want to call it. Um, those of you who ever watched the uh, series Supernatural on television, I think they call it the pit there. They've got quite a few things right there. They've got other things a bit wrong. I don't think devils appear as human beings with uh, red eyes looking at you but um, uh, especially not as very beautiful women and all that um, they've got some of that a bit, they've exaggerated but a lot of the basic stuff they've got quite right there interestingly enough but you leave these things alone because you're not going to get persons that contacting you you're going to get entities which will mislead and damage you and cause harm you're opening a channel to something that should be left closed now then people say, well, we do pray to saints. Yeah, we talk to saints, just like we talk to other fellow Christians, because death is a change, not a barrier. The communion of saints is a doctrine of the Catholic Church. We say it in the Creed every Sunday. The communion of the saints, the community of the saints, it goes beyond death. And most Christians are dead people. If you do your statistics, obviously, start doing some sums, they've got there, and they're more real than we are. We're in shadow land here. Okay, our bodies are real, matter's real. The church takes matter seriously, theology of the body. And Christ didn't say, this is my spirit. He said, this is my body, this is my blood. The risen Lord rose in his real flesh. It wasn't a spook. It's, the body is important. But this is shadow land. We still haven't got there. We're still in the land of the mirrors, seeing darkly, as Paul puts it. So we don't try and pull them in here. And they don't want to come here anyway. But there are times when it seems they're permitted to contact us. Sometimes in dreams, sometimes very vivid dreams, and there's quite a lot of literature on that, serious literature on it, um, and in the lives of saints too. And, so, and in certain prominent Christians we call saints who do sometimes appear on planet Earth. Padre Pio has a habit of doing this still. He's been dead since 1968. 